Welcome to the Invincible Innovation Show, the podcast for changemakers. Each week, I talk to the most fascinating entrepreneurs and innovation leaders about innovation, strategy, and design. Hey, everyone. And the question we're here today to ask is, how can we bridge human intelligence and artificial intelligence? Welcome to Invincible Innovation Live. I'm Adima Zorkario, innovation and value creation expert, and I'll be your host. And today with me, I have a very good friend and a great person, Alon Harris. Hi there, Adi. Good morning and hi to everyone listening. Oh, I'm so happy to see you here. We talked in the past and I know it's going to be so interesting and insightful. So I'm calm. Alon is the head of data science training lab at Bayer. And, and we're uh, live on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook, and, and you're much invited to join the discussion and ask questions, and we would love to hear from you, right? Just a little confession from my side. I'm, I'm really excited today. Uh, yes. This is my first LinkedIn Live broadcast, so thank you, Adi. And it's a huge privilege being on your show after seeing so many wonderful guests before. I hope I don't let the audience down. Yeah, no way. You know, like we've done so many talks, and I know it's going to be fun, so... And we're on a good, good path so we can start. So tell us about the data science and innovation training program that you uh, developed. It's, it's one of my favorite questions. <laughs> so I think maybe um, to kind of bring this story into context, I'm going to go back to uh, 2017. And I got on a plane from Tel Aviv to Berlin to meet my very good colleagues, Melanie and Timo, in Bayer's offices in Berlin. And we're sitting in a room in, in front of this giant whiteboard. And the objective of this brainstorming session was to create a program that would enable us to upskill our amazing scientists in Bayer uh, in this domain of data science and artificial intelligence. And Towards this meeting, we'd conducted interviews, you know, we, we tried to learn what the realities on the ground are, what are the different perspectives that we should be considering, what would be a meaningful training journey for these wonderful scientists. And, you know, we learned that there's a bridge that needs to be built. It's not sufficient enough to teach people to be literate in this type of technology. Uh, I mean, that is an important element of teaching terms and core concepts. But if you really want them to embrace this way of thinking and um, be creative and be entrepreneurial and spread this to their environment, we needed to invent something that isn't a classical training program about knowledge transfer. We had to create something more, I would say, immersive. And so, We decided on that day that we're going to call our program the R&D Tech Immersion with the idea that people are going to be thrown in the deep end and have to swim in this new domain by trying to solve real challenges that we were facing uh, back then uh, in, in different scientific domains and try, as they go through this journey, to apply what they learn in the training to real data, real users, real business dynamics, um, and, and also kind of deal with the real constraints of life. Uh, um, yeah. And what we were kind of looking for is something that makes it extremely personal and extremely real. And we thought that that would bridge these two areas of human intelligence and artificial intelligence. Yeah, and I know that many in many cases, the uh, engineers, they are so good in the details, in the technical stuff, but to really convey the ideas and to, to spread the message is so, it's, it's a different talent, I would say. So it's something that you need to know. I think it's a very good point you're raising because uh, part of the preparation for this program we had to invent was we did some market research. We wanted to see what are uh, the training solutions that are available for anyone who wants to um, do this in, in their organization so that um, people would be able to apply artificial intelligence in real circumstances. And we saw that there was a, a strict kind of dichotomy. You either had training programs that were extremely technical basically saying if you want to navigate in this domain you're going to have to learn to code you're going to have to learn a uh, very advanced mathematics and statistics or we found programs that were focused more on innovation bringing in approaches like design thinking lean startup 
agile uh, business model canvas, but they weren't necessarily applying it or, or using these uh, methods specifically dealing with data science and artificial right. intelligence. So we tried to create this hybrid and try and yeah. strike a balance between these two because that's that's what we were we, we wanted. We wanted people to appreciate the technology, but understand that you have to have skills to solve problems with it. And that's that's uh, that requires a different toolkit. And how how did you really train these people? It needs to be a very unique way of, of merging these two. Yeah, so um it was a very big whiteboard. <laughs> And yeah, the reason absolutely. it the reason it was very big is because we were looking for a journey that would take a few months. We didn't want this to be one of those um experiences where you you leave your job for a week or two and then come back. We thought that that wouldn't create the necessary change. So we built a program that had multiple milestones that you go through as a team. And the teams were constructed on purpose with one data scientist and about four to five life scientists. They could be people who spend their day-to-day -day in labs or people who are dealing with scientific business processes. And each team was given a real challenge at the very get-go. So they knew from the start that the business is expecting them to come yeah. up with something that will solve or address a, a burning challenge. And what we did is we created um, points in time where they would learn and a lot of time in between where they would explore, where they would apply. And uh, this kind of created this kind of an accordion. Uh, and instead of a high intensity, uh, short engagement, it created something that I think was more balanced and enabled them also to be opportunistic. Because one of the great things when you do a program over time is that things change in the business, change, things change in the market, things change in the, tech, uh, in the technological arena. And we wanted them to think as well opportunistically of how do I ride on this opportunity? How do I tap yeah. into this business decision? Yeah, I, I really agree with you. In many cases, these like inter interventions are very short and, and it's like there is this hype of, yeah, we're, we're there and then they need to really execute it. And it's so much harder than when you're dripping it one after the other. It's like seeding one after the other and then it's growing in the end and you are not really in one point of the time. You know how many times I've seen this dynamic? I, I mean, I've been, I've been uh, coaching and training in the innovation domain for more than 10 years. And I understand why we sometimes do those types of activities that totally disconnect yeah. you. But what happens is you get such a cold shower and such a cold shoulder from the people you rely on later that it doesn't actually create business impact. Yeah. And I think what we wanted in this training program to tell the businesses, yes, it's about giving skills to people, but we are very serious about your challenges. And the, a good example of how we, we did that was we ensured that the program ended with a pitch to very senior executives asking for real money, asking for these projects, not to just stay as a sandbox practice topic, but actually mm -hmm. evolve into real projects. And, and, and I'm very proud to say that um, th that's exactly what we were able to achieve. Um, we, we were able to migrate projects in a training context to projects in a real digital pipeline. Um, yeah. And to date, I think about 15 projects, 15 to 20 oh. projects received funding. So that's, wow. that's a good indication. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's exceptional. In many cases, uh, the number of, of projects that really go live and, and stay alive afterwards is very, very small for so many reasons. So what would be the main obstacles for, for a digital transformation like that? Mm. Well, wow. I think, you know, it's a jungle of obstacles and risks. Yeah. And in a way, um, I think part of the damage that all the hype does, it creates a romance around these technologies. Yeah, and yeah what there we is purposely, this, the hype yeah. around AI is like, wow. I think it's the highest uh, right now, I guess. Every, every few years we have a hype around something. Um, yeah. And even within AI, there are subtopics that get hyped uh, in different phases over time. And... I think hype is sometimes just a, a, a necessity to get attention, to get awareness, to get funding, to get resources, to be allowed to experiment, but it's not a sufficient um, enough condition yeah. to see tangible business outcomes. So the risks I think, or the, 
the risks, I think the first primary risk in digital transformation is not knowing what the risks are. Because that type of romantic perspective says, you know what, let's just jump in, let's build a, a, a model, let's get all this data, let's try yeah. and, 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 and hopefully there'll be this moment in time where we click a button, everybody will love our idea, the machine will give such a, an amazing output, and we're all going to make a big you know, change in the world. And yeah. of course, the reality is not that. So we have, I think, three categories of, of risks. We have strategic risks. Uh, that means that we might be investing our energy on solving challenges that are not linked to where the business is heading, to the North Star that we should be following. Um, and I think that is very important to take into consideration. What's the broad context of what the business wants to, to, to do in the future? What do we, who do we want to be and what is the value we want to provide? And how do our efforts with these new technologies accelerate our ability to get there? Uh, of course, there's technical uh, um, sure. risks and technical hurdles. Uh, I've heard so many people saying the following, I'm sitting on a gold mine. I have so much data. I, I feel that all I need is a clever data scientist and we're going to be able to get diamonds yeah. out of the rough. Yeah. And the reality yeah, is, is, you know, the reality is there is no uh, magic. And in many cases, uh, there is a process of disillusionment because you don't have enough data or the data might not be accessible or findable, the quality might be low. And in many of these uh, applications, like machine learning or deep learning, you need very large quantities yeah. of data, of, of the quality data. That, and good data. So uh, of course, this links to IT infrastructure and how data is generated, et cetera. But I would yeah. say the one that's most interesting for me, oh, sorry, I stopped you in the middle. Yeah, I want to say about the the quantity of data. I heard um, someone from uh, google.org and they had AI uh, projects for medical uh, uh, domain. And uh, he said that the main obstacle for them is to get the data. And, and, and I said to myself, it's Google. The, the mm. problem is data for Google. I know there is all these privacy issues with the hospitals and, but still, can you just encrypt it or something? Like, can't you get the data? And if he's saying that, I guess that yeah. many other companies find it challenging. And, and, and look, at Bayer, we have more than 15,000 scientists in our R&D organization. We are a data-rich, data-driven organization. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the data that is generated in the day-to-day, -day, in, the, in, the, in the systems that we use or in the um, um, processes that we apply, that they necessarily are good enough or applicable enough for these uh, uh, AI applications. Um, and sometimes it means that you have to realize that uh, there's a constraint in terms of data availability and quality. But it doesn't mean it's the end of the road. It just means you might have to um, adjust your vision yeah, or work harder. work harder to reconstruct the IT architecture and sometimes the data generation front ends to, to totally ch shift uh, uh, you know, the processes of data generation and, and curation. It, it's not just about quantity and quality. It's also to do with standards. You know, uh, you need data to be labeled in certain ways, et cetera. And there's, yeah. uh, and you know, in many, many cases, it's kind of, I'm sure I'm speaking to people out there that they will recognize it. Sometimes the issue is that people in an organization have their data on their laptops, not in the central, you know, data pool or data yeah. hub. And that's also an issue. Uh, so lots of technical yeah. hurdles there. But yeah. for me, the most interesting and most complicated hurdle is not the strategic one, it's not the technical one, it's the cultural one. Because we're trying to introduce a new way of uh, leveraging our data to solve real world problems, but in the middle are people who've been used to working in a certain way, uh, making decisions in a certain way, and uh, when, there, when always you're trying to use something that is a novel technology, it comes with either hyped expectations, or fear. And so um, it, it takes time to make your culture, your organizational culture, starting from the top in your leadership team, but all the way down to be open, to be open to trying out the, these new technologies and to trusting them and believing that they, they can deliver. And that's a journey that doesn't get solved yeah. you know, overnight. Yeah. yeah, I think especially with AI, the, the aspect of fear is even more with the new technology because many people connected to 
like you know like uh, the robots will come and, and take our jobs or something like that and yeah so uh, things in Hollywood uh, sometimes are more scary than in reality and I think what we try to do in this program purposely is uh, create a more realistic expectation and uh, align people on what these technologies can really deliver today versus you know where the ambition is in the future and you know that's a very humbling experience and um, So for example, I think we have a lot of uh, wish in, in, in different business areas to move into predictive analytics. That's where yeah. your machines are basically helping you predict certain outcomes so that you can navigate your decision making accordingly. And sometimes it's just premature to move to that domain and you have to maybe begin with something a bit more modest like visual analytics, which is Just making your data more accessible and being able to explore it through visual aids and tools and uh, that sometimes is perceived as maybe a, a lower uh, kind of uh, yeah. on, on the hierarchy a lower yeah. grade not that analytics. sophisticated not that sexy not that sophisticated but to be honest if it's helping you take positive steps to solving your challenge yeah. you have to do it and it's a great place to begin yeah and I think it's a way for people to uh, be more like willing to To be part of it because they say oh okay it's not instead of us it's like helping us make better decisions so it's it's another step on the way and yeah. it's really important I, I think it's so important what you just said the key word for me is amplify the, the the AI should be a tool to amplify human intelligence it's it's not self-serving we don't do uh, predictive analytics or um, you know all, all these different applications to Just to prove that we could it's got to help the people who are experts who have authority who have access to resources to the decision makers we need to help them amplify their intelligence we mustn't forget that at the end of the day um, there is so much value in experience and expertise I'm thinking you know in our in our company we're dealing with health and we're dealing with nutrition so think of a doctor or think of a farmer and Uh, when you bring data to them or when you bring insights to them, they see things that only they can see because of the years of experience, because they're in the field and because uh, they're living uh, you know the, the realities. And so it's not something you can do in isolation in a lab uh, alone and just expect that you or I could look at the same insights and perceive them the same. Yeah. So the, the idea is you have to bridge the user. The decision maker the action taker to the insight and I think that is where uh, you either see companies succeed or fail I think that's one of the major parts that are indicative of success or failure how well did you be user centric and learn and, and remember that the technology needs to support the user sure. and not and not just like a maybe you know just prove that you could create some sort of a cool output on a machine and But no one no yeah. one uses it yeah or trusts it or, or say yeah I, I trust what they're saying although like uh, 15 years I've been doing my calculations alone with my excels and now you come and what is exactly what you're doing be, uh, beneath the hood that I trust you to do b- better than me this is really important we are we have to have empathy towards the people we're trying to to help and support and that empathy is has to take into account that the way they make decisions today um, uh, it will not just be replaced overnight just because we have a cool yeah. tool uh, it supports their professional confidence it might be the source of their professional authority um, yeah. uh, it, it's a way for them uh, to use their gut feeling uh, and to Yeah. just kind of bringing in um, uh, this new different uh, perspective on the same reality that they've been dealing with day in day out that yeah. that is something you have to monitor you have to you have to observe that inter you know that that engagement yeah sure I th- I've done a, a one project with a medical um, tests a uh, startup and I it was the first time I understood that it doesn't matter the, the parameters could be very very precise but the person who really interprets the the data is the one to decide if you have AIDS or not so it, yeah. it, you could have the same results in one country and he will say yes you have AIDS and in the other country you'll say you don't have it and for me it was like just weird there's a test there are, these are the numbers. Right. And it's much more complex than what we think. So there are so complex. many, so many and, people and who know that, how to do these calculations and understanding, which is more than the numbers. 
You know, I, I, I think we need to remember as well when we're applying these or when we were building this program in a corporate setting, okay? Not uh, uh, in, a, in a startup, but in a large corporation, then of course, one of the things you have to take into consideration is that if you're actually successful, you might actually be changing a whole process. You might be impacting not one person, but thousands of people in the way they work. Or if you think of a solution that we deliver to a customer, it's not one doctor, it might be thousands of doctors or hundreds of thousands of farmers. And so one of the things you have to understand is that you're going to perhaps disrupt whole operating models, business models, that's at the extreme, right? Yeah. And that means that change management and communication are equally important to the technology you're developing. Sure. The ability to easily and, and, and effectively convey why is the thing you're developing going to make everyone else's lives better. And I think yeah. that's another weakness or another risk. Um, I think uh, scientists, data scientists, uh, they have a richness of vocabulary. They have, uh, and that's, uh, I think, uh, very important, of course, because that's uh, an indication of their broad education. But when we speak to um, customers, even to executives, we have to translate or we have to find a way to speak in the language of the audience in a way that right. they understand. Because, like you say, in many cases, it's a black box and trust in black boxes is a bit of a, you know, that's a topic that how yeah. do you build that trust? Yeah, and the trust needs to be from within the company, from the leaders and the managers and everyone who is involved, and from the other side of the uh, clients and users. They both need to trust you that you're doing something that they get something better from it. And especially with leaders, it's really hard because let's say, think even about how do the you get incentivized. Let's say you have like 100 people uh, um, that you are managing. And then this thing could be like you have 30% less people. Mm. So maybe you will not be so happy to bring something into your company and, and, and especially to your department and, and change the way that you're incentivized. I think I think you're you're mentioning a very important point, and that is what is the or how do you manage these processes whereby uh, the technology will perhaps take uh, part of uh, the uh, existing tasks in the organization and automate them, et cetera. And I think a responsible organization uh, doesn't look at these technologies as a way of replacing people, uh, but uh, because the expertise you have in the organization is by far the most important asset. I think it's about making your your experts work better, faster, with ease, leveraging their expertise, not wasting their time on manual or inefficient uh, work. Yeah. Um, and we haven't, I think we have to be very careful as well as we build these um, new technologies into the company that we don't create these uh, fear scenarios or revolution scenarios because the reality is so far from it. It takes yeah. a long time even for the most simplest application of, of machine learning or deep learning, it, it takes time. And what we try in our program to do, what we try to do is ensure two things, that the user, the end user, is part of the journey from day one till the end of that six month program, and that the executives are part of the journey from day one till the end. We didn't wanna lose sight of the uh, emotional reactions and of the uh, perspectives of the people who in the end are the benefactors of this technology. And we didn't want to lose sight with the strategic perspective either. So we basically had systematic engagements all along yeah. the journey. Um, because if you isolate the inventor and you work in a, in a bubble, what happens is you have a clash of of temperatures, <laughs> uh, yeah. you have something very hot meeting something very cold and that just creates steam. So um, we wanted to mitigate that. And surprisingly, when users, especially again, in, if your users are in the organization and they are part of the definition of the vision, then that fear element is dramatically mitigated because people own the narrative. You co-created it with them. And I think that's a far more sustainable way of doing this. Yeah, I agree. And this is another advantage of doing things which is like long lasting and not like this is what we decided and, and then try to sell it to the to these both sides because you are engaged in all through the way. We have uh, someone telling us that uh, data doesn't lie. Sankap 
Para, thank you. <laughs> You're right. It's, People it's, trust. It's a, it, but, you know, it's interesting on that comment is that today one of the topics we are discussing is human bias put into the data. Yeah. And I think what we have to be very, very careful with is we should not perceive data as this all objective element in the universe because that data was generated most likely with human intention or with human intervention in place. Yeah, right. Uh, a, a good example is, you know, if you're calling a call center uh, of some company and they're typing down notes based on the call, um, that person based on their mood in that day and based on the words they use in that day is influencing the data. It's not purely uh, uh, objective. Of course, and, and, and uh, you see it in image recognition too. that they took all the pictures from the web and most of them are white male. So you're, you cannot be equally um, objective to anything, right? Yeah. So gender equality is an interesting element. So I've, I've heard some use cases about trying to use these methods to better recruit talents. And so if your historical data of your own organization is, is based on a bias towards a certain, you know, let's say, sure. like you said, a gender, then don't expect the machine uh, to provide you necessarily with a different output because it's going to be rewarded as it learns based on the historic successes. And sure. so we, bias in data is something that is very uh, a hot topic and also the explainability of the AI. So today we're talking about uh, how can we um, explain how the machine came to the positive outcome? Because sometimes we were very, very pleased with the success rate of a certain yeah. uh, model, but we don't necessarily know why. And so these are topics that scientists today are dealing with, making things more explainable. So I think when we say uh, AI, it sounds like an isolation of humans, but the truth yeah. is, It's about humans in the entry point when we generate the data, and it's about humans at the end point when we use the insights to take action. It's all about humans. It's about yeah. humans and machines and their relationship. Right. I, uh, one of the cases that I went to talk, I think it was in Austria, in one of the conferences, they brought a uh, Boston Dynam Dynamics, you know, with the robots, which are very, uh, like, mm -hmm. yeah, they, they look very impressive and, and, and very fearful, I would say. And uh, one of the scientists who talked in the co convention, he said that if we would have known what they know, nobody would really believe that uh, machines will ever uh, conquer the earth because <laughs> it took so long just to make them flip and, ch and turn. Like it, it looks so impressive in the video, but they know how much work was done in order to create that. Yes, <laughs> yes. And this, this is, a, I think, um, especially in, a, in a, an organization like the one I'm in, we're very ambitious about the way we are using science and, and the way we're using data science. And I think, yes, you do want a vision, a long-term vision that is, I would say, audacious. You want something there in the horizon that is going to inspire and that might be a bit sounding like something science fiction or out of a movie. So if you don't have that spark that the future could be dramatically different than the present, you know, why, why would, would anyone be an innovator yeah. or an entrepreneur? Having yeah. said that, what we try and did in this program is teach people how to show how you get from here to there. And the approach we took was to say, try and build a roadmap to your very you know, lofty vision in five increments. We chose the number five because three is, is too few. It's too, you, you have two big chunks. The chunks are too big. And 10, no executive would ever approve of a roadmap with so many steps. Yeah. So try and show five increments. And the condition was in each increment, A, you have to deliver value, even if it's modest. So the idea is, what can you do in six months, despite all the constraints that people will say, oh, This is going to help me make a better medical decision or health-related decision or agriculture-related uh, decision. And the idea is, if you are successful in each of these steps individually, only then do you progress to the next. It's kind of an agile mindset. Yeah. Each step is an experiment, but you are promising that in each step you deliver certain value. And you know what? It's a very hard exercise to do yeah, because you're trying to get to a very... Um, kind of big vision and the realities are sometimes highly constrained. Let's remember, you know, resources, time, regulation, availability of data. And so I would say the hardest steps in this journey are steps three, 
and four. It's that middle zone, okay? It's like, where, where can I, how do I bridge between the current present that is highly constrained and that future in which I believe I will have all the available resources I have. And, and, but you know what? It's really helped us to build stories this way and to um, align expectations this way because people are then not expecting that overnight you will reach the moon and overnight there'll be this magical machine where you click a button and it will tell you what the next big drug uh, you, 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 you need yeah. to develop is. That is sure. very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that it gives you as, as an entrepreneur a, vi a vision which is like you could perceive it and you could tell the story about it. It's not enough that you could understand that it's achievable. You could tell others, this is the way I'm going to achieve it. And, and then it's more accessible and very, it's very important. And we found that if the vision is, is you know, has that emotional component, because it's not just about um, mitigating uh, the number of mistakes you make or, you know, just making better decisions. It's about people's quality of life. It's about mit mitigating disease. It's about increasing the yield of, of a farm. And it's about making livelihood of those farmers better. You will find that if your vision uh, is is really inspiring, you will find partners. You will find others who will want to come on board and take part in that vision. And I've seen many of our projects that we incubated in the program grow into partnerships or open innovation opportunities with academia, with startups, with other uh, organizations externally, because they might have a different approach or a different set of uh, skills, but the vision is where we, we, we have a common ground. And I think that's a very important um, reason to really well articulate your vision. And, and you'll find that you're not the only one with that same vision. Sure. So what would be your number one tip for innovation leaders? Wow. Um, we could take a whole day. It wouldn't yeah, be one right. tip. Um, so I think one of the things that we, we tend to do when we speak about innovation or innovation with technology, like in, in the digital aspect, is we put a lot of focus on the idea generation process, on the possibilities, on um, the uh, exciting part of the journey, which is how can we solve a problem, right? But I think we don't put enough effort or enough energy as innovation leaders in making sure that those, the best ideas get experimented, validated, and implemented at scale. And scale is a big issue. It's a big hurdle. Implementation is 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 a thing that isn't always waking up in the morning feeling excited and being able to get a an animator to sketch and help you bring an idea to life on uh, visually it's tough it's about it's an uphill battle it's about m managing a lot of resistance um it's about frustration sometimes because it's all experimental and so I would say to the innovation leaders, one thing is be very cognizant of what your implementation mechanisms are and how you enable them to be agile and scalable. But on the other hand, make sure that the people you put in place to drive these projects are absolutely crazy about that vision. Um, if they perceive this as project management per se, they will not get to the finish line. They will, yeah. they will burn too early. You need someone who is so crazy in love with that vision that they have the energy to overcome all the hurdles, to stay persistent, to have that uh, um, um, courage to, to deal with the resistance because that is entrepreneurship or that is entrepreneurship in our context in reality. There is no red carpet that somebody says, you know what, I have an empty check for you. Where do I sign? You know what, yeah. you need these experts. Here they are. You know what, you need me to change the IT architecture and our uh, internal processes. For sure, we can do it overnight. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's not reality. Yeah, I think that in general, the life of an entrepreneur, entrepreneur it, is something that it's like a roller coaster. You need to be able oh mentally God. to do that. It's and hard. that roller coaster, I think, experience, uh, we, we, um, we had a participant in our second cohort. So we ran this program three times. We had 100 alumni. And one of the alumni was asked by us to write an article 
to share internally so that others would be able to uh, kind of connect to what was the experience going through the program. Yeah. <laughs> so from an outside perspective, you see, okay, on, in this month they learned this, in this month they did a uh, hackathon, in this month they, 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 they got trained on this topic. It looks so obvious. But the term, the title he used was um, my roller coaster, my data science roller wow. coaster, and had this image of a, of a, of wow. a roller coaster 360. Because what they learned, and this is, I think, all entrepreneurs would know, is that where you begin that initial understanding of the problem and of the solution you need to put in place, that is going to change through this journey. Uh, you, 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 you have to have a thick skin uh, to deal with all these uh, dynamics and emotions. And, you know, when we hack, uh, we did a hackathon in each of these programs. So like my last cohort, we did 10 hackathons because we had 10 teams in one week. It was kind of nuts. Wow. You come out of the hackathon, sometimes re-energized because the technology has proven your hypothesis, or you come out actually going, uh-oh, situation is worse. If you stop at that point with discouragement, you know, you're never gonna, you're, you're never going to be able to ride this uh, roller coaster for, for a very long time. And that stamina, I think is very important for entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs alike. Yeah, I think that there is this flexibility, which a mental flexibility that you need in order to really hold this inside and to go through all these changes and hurdles and and and, and trials. And you know, I have I, I'm looking to the side because I have this note in in my uh, in my office saying, "Exceptional people convert life's setbacks into future successes." It's Carol Dweck, it's and beautiful. I always have it. Yeah, I have it in front of me because I really believe in that. Like it's... you need. To have that, it goes, and I think it goes very deep into uh, who you are and how you perceive life. And I think for many people, this program that we thought was all going to be up here in the intellectual domain became a very personal experience. Because when you get to that finish line, after all you've gone through and all the changes, etc., you've learned something about your uh, yourself, your tools, yeah. and also I think you've learned about the power of the team. So I think one of the issues we're facing in the technology arena or innovation, uh, digital innovation arena is we're looking for these unicorns, people who can do this and this and this and this. So they're technology experts and they're communicative and they're entrepreneurial and they're open-minded uh, and they can take others with you on the journey. And of course, you might find one unicorn like that, but unicorns are so rare. And I believe we need to shift to the perception of unicorn teams where each person is very distinctively talented in you know one of these areas and it's the chemistry between them that does the magic and uh, this takes time teams don't just appear uh, that team culture uh, that ability to communicate across disciplines that ability to um, uh, deal with the hurdles together that is not something that will happen just by putting people in a room and hoping that they'll come up with good good ideas and solutions that has to be nurtured and i think reflected on as these dynamics take place during the journey so one of the nice things we did in in our second and third cohorts is we brought in uh, alumni of the first and so first and second cohorts and we we created this coaching layer so people who had been through this journey served as i would say liaisons or uh, you know uh, they they accompanied uh, their their team the new teams and i think that brought in some real good perspective on a personal level i've been through this i know what it looks like you might be discouraged now but trust me you'll get to the end and knowing that the person who's saying this to you really did go through this creates a very credible i think resource for empathy for support for empowerment and also a nice way to build a community between the different generations that we had right right so i think it's it's a great way to just to take all and and close all we've talked to till now and it went so so fast for me but to to emphasize the importance of the human abilities and the collaboration co-creation abilities is, is so important and and if somebody has any like additional question where can they approach you 
So it's a good it's a it's a good point. So one thing is we we've created a group on LinkedIn called Data Science for a Better Life. Mm -hmm. uh, so Bayer's uh, um, um, mission is science for a better life. That's all we do all day long is think how can we improve lives uh, around the world through health and nutrition. So Data Science for a Better Life is a play on that on that. And in there you can find information about the different activities we're doing in this domain. We also publish research uh, that we do in this area. And there are also opportunities to join us if, if people are uh, curious about uh, growth opportunities in our organization. And we hope to be soon publishing a specific uh, article on this program because we think that this immersive way of uh, learning is applicable not just in data science, in any other innovation uh, domain, and that this is something companies hopefully would be inspired to, to do themselves. Yeah. So when that publication comes out, I'll let you know. Sure. So it's been so, like, as always, inspiring and fun. And I'm so happy that you joined me. So thank you, Alon. Thank you, Adi. And thanks, everyone, for joining today. Yeah, thank you. And to all of you change makers out there, thank you for joining us. We'll be here for another episode next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm Adima Zaukario, and you've been listening to the Invincible Innovation Podcast. Make sure to visit our website, invincibleinnovation.com, where you can learn more about our programs and my book, Innovating Through Chaos. I'll be waiting for you next week in our next episode. Thank you for listening.